All right, the book of Ecclesiastes. Let me start out uh, by saying that this is one of my very favorite books in the Bible. That's sort of a running joke. But I love the book of Ecclesiastes, even though it's, it's certainly not all sweetness and light. In fact, one of the things I love about it is that it is so um, absolutely honest about everything. Um, Thomas Wolfe, who you may be familiar with, an American novelist, said this about the book of Ecclesiastes. Of all that I have seen or learned, that book, Ecclesiastes, seems to me to be the noblest, the wisest, and the most powerful expression of man's life upon the earth, and also the highest flower of poetry, eloquence, and truth. I could say that Ecclesiastes is the greatest single piece of writing I have ever known, and the wisdom expressed in it is the most lasting and profound. Pretty high praise, um, and I think probably justified. Ecclesiastes is part of wisdom literature, which is why, as Thomas Wolfe says, there is wisdom expressed in it. Um, it's also the only book of the Bible that has inspired a hit rock and roll song. Turn, Turn, Turn by the Birds is entirely the book of Ecclesiastes, and we'll look at some of those passages in a few minutes. Um, so, you know, rock and roll. Um, I want to start out looking at briefly about uh, the authorship of the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, traditionally, well, the, the Hebrew title of this book is Koheleth spelled either with a Q or with a K, and it means preacher or teacher, quite literally, maybe more literally, it means gatherer, but the, the indication is one who gathers together a group to speak to, like, you know, a, a preacher calls forth the congregation or whatever. So preacher or teacher is usually the way that Kohelet is translated, uh, teacher most commonly of all. The Greek translation of the name of the word Kohelet, which is, it's called, uh, in Hebrew Kohelet, because that's the first word in the book. Many of the Hebrew books, I think I've said before, are named based upon the first word of the book. Uh, Genesis, the first word is um, is origins or its beginnings. You know, in the beginning. So it says beginnings was when God created the heavens and the earth. This book starts with the word Kohelet, meaning preacher or teacher, um, in, in Hebrew. The Greek translation of that word Kohelet, or teacher, is Ecclesiastes. Um, e KK is how we usually transliterate the Greek. You know what transliteration is? It's when you take the sounds of the letters of a language and, and reproduce them in a different alphabet. So in Greek letters, if you transliterate it into English letters, it looks like E-K-K-L-E-S. The root of that is Ecclesia, which means church, right? We talked about that in the, if you're in the, it's called Systematic Theology 2 class, we did the Doctrine of the Church. Ecclesia means church in Greek. So Ecclesiastes is the one who calls together the church, the preacher or the teacher, the gatherer. Now that then got transliterated again, uh, or got transliterated into Latin as Ecclesiastes. Okay, now, one thing, don't make a mistake between Ecclesiastes and Ecclesiasticus. There is a book in the Apocrypha which is a, uh, also considered a wisdom book, it's in the, but it's in the, uh, you know, the Catholic part of the Bible that we don't have in our Bible, called Ecclesiasticus. Those are two different books. They're not related to each other. Ecclesiastes is in our Bible. Ecclesiasticus is added in the Apocrypha in the Hebrew Bible. Okay? I say that because many, many, many years ago when I wanted to, to, to study Ecclesiastes for the first time, I looked up some stuff, and I'm reading this, and I'm going, boy, this doesn't sound familiar, and I was reading Ecclesiasticus. Okay. Um, so, so the the beginning, chapter one, verse one, Koheleth, the teacher or preacher, introduces himself in this way: the words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now, the book of Ecclesiastes is technically anonymous. What we mean by that, when we say a book is anonymous, is it does not identify within itself who the author is. Uh, unlike Paul's letters which say, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the church in Corinth, for instance. This is technically anonymous. The authorship has been traditionally attributed to Solomon for several reasons. The primary one is that first verse. The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Who was the son of David who became king in Jerusalem? Solomon. Now that sounds pretty obvious, uh, but it's also... Um, Jesus was called the son of David. Anyone who's considered in the line of David, or anyone who follows after David, in kingship or in, you know, in, in terms of any genetic link, is always called the son of David. David is kind of the reference point. 
and there were other kings in Jerusalem. Um, but Solomon Solomon's the simplest explanation of that, and you know Occam's razor in philosophy, Occam's razor basically says the simplest answer is almost always the right one. And so it, uh, traditionally it's used as Solomon, I see no reason to have a problem with that. It's also true that the range of activities and experiences that are described would only be possible by somebody who had the kind of wealth that Solomon had. Because he talks about, you know, buying land and slaves and animals and planting vineyards and putting in waterworks and all, you know, all this kind of stuff. That's not something that an ordinary person would do. Now, there, there are some issues that would cause us to question whether this is written by Solomon. Some of the language um, sounds more like post-Babylonian post, um, the, the post exile kind of language because of some of the references that are used. There are some things in this book that appear to be Aramaic, uh, more Aramaic or at least influenced by Aramaic, and that didn't come in until after the Babylonian exile. That's not conclusive, but there are some questions about that. It's also true that in ancient times, the ancient writing of the ancient Near East, because wisdom literature was popular, you know, that's there's more wisdom literature than just our books of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Job, and parts of Psalms. There was other ancient Near Eastern uh, li wisdom literature. And one of the styles of that wisdom literature sometimes was a, a, fictional, um, auto a fictional biography or autobiography. They would present something as an autobiography, and especially of a king, in order to make a point, because that's sort of the extreme example of human existence, and so they could draw conclusions. Um, it would be sort of like drawing a moral lesson from the life of the, the, most, the most famous celebrity, you know, Marilyn Monroe. Okay, what do we learn from her? So there was a fictional uh, wisdom literature in the ancient Near East that would do that. They would, uh, they would have a, a, a fictional autobiography or biography of a, a famous person in order to draw some wisdom conclusions. It's possible that it's that. Either way, and I tend toward the idea that it was written by Solomon, either way we believe uh, that there's a reason God put it here. Okay, now, um, there are several reasons why this book has had, had trouble getting into the canon. And in fact, there's even more concern about, um, about how that decision was even made. Because Ecclesiastes, we, it's hard to say what is this book about. Because there are some places it seems very positive and encouraging, encouraging you know, fear God and obey his commandments, you know, and, and God blesses uh, people who, who obey him with wisdom and all sorts of things. But there are other places that it's deeply pessimistic. You know, meaningless, meaningless, life is meaningless, or vanity, vanity, all is vanities, as, as we learned it in King James. Um, it's, sometimes he seems coherent, sometimes he seems un incoherent. There are places where he contradicts himself, and there are places where he says things that contradict other statements in the Old Testament. Not contradictory in a way that is theologically you know, catastrophic, but for instance, in one place in the book of Ecclesiastes, Coelet, the writer, says that given the meaninglessness of life, it'd be better never to have lived or been born. And in another place, he says even a, dead, uh, even a live dog is better than a dead lion, meaning better to be alive than not. Okay? Um, and by the way, dogs, this is always hard for me to say, dogs are always a negative in the Bible. All right? Dog never means anything good in the Bible. A dog was, you know, like the old expression, you dirty dog. Okay, well, that's very biblical. The, the Bible, whenever it uses the a reference to dogs, it's a negative thing. And as somebody who loves dogs, that's hard for me. Um, it's also true, by the way, I've said before, whenever you read anything about a horse in the Bible, that has to do with military. Horses were not used for anything except military. Anything else, they use a mule, a mule or a burro. But a uh, horse is a military thing. So there's there's uh, implication, or there's there's meaning behind those, those kinds of references. So... Um, so it, it was, has been a struggle to understand how it is. And also, the, the simple fact is that the, the book of Ecclesiastes, it, it um, never really talks about God as uh, God's law or the chosen people. It doesn't, it doesn't deal with God in any way similar to the other books in the Old Testament. Um, and all of them the more, most significant Jewish theological themes, the law, the covenant, the chosen people, all of those big topics that, that virtually all the Old Testament are about one way or the other are completely absent from Ecclesiastes. 
it is one man's struggle with the meaning of life. Um, the Council of Jamnia in the first century, um, in the first century A.D., this is where the Jewish people decided what is in their canon. The Council of Jamnia was an important part of that. Other things happened later, but that was the primary one. Um, the, the story came out that in the Council of Jamnia, they decided that this should be in the canon because it had Solomon's name associated with it. Even though, again, there's some question whether Solomon really wrote it. We believe it was. That, that whatever else it did, that was sufficient to get it into the canon. Okay? Um, there are other people that say, uh, that have said that the reason it got canonized or put in the canon is because for all of the other, you know, uh, pessimism, challenging, questioning, life isn't worth it, everything is meaningless, everything is vanity, even wisdom has its strict limits, that in the end, in the epilogue, the reader's told to fear God and keep his commandments, and that made it sufficiently orthodox from a Jewish perspective that they agreed to put it in the canon. Ultimately, we don't really know what the process was that got us there, but we know there have always been a lot of questions about that. One scholar put, put it sort of some, after looking at all the different possible reasons why it was in the canon and possible reasons why it shouldn't have been included in the canon, one scholar simply said, in short, we do not know why or how this book uh, found its way into such esteemed company. So Ecclesiastes has always been sort of an outlier of a book, both in terms of the content and in terms of how people viewed it. My own sense, when I say that it's one of my very favorite books, is the extraordinary honesty of this book is, to me, the thing that makes it worthy of being in canon. There is nothing sugarcoated in the book of Ecclesiastes. It is a hard, honest, even, you know, um, I, I can't imagine a, uh, a more vulnerable or honest way of looking at human life and experience. The idea is that if Solomon were the one who was responsible for this, as again I believe he is, and tradition has said that, that this would have been Solomon late in his life. Now you remember Solomon early, when God asked Solomon when he first became king, what do you want? What is, what is it that you want me to give you as you become king? And Solomon said, I desire wisdom to be able to rule over your people. And God said, that's a really good answer. Because that's what you've asked for, I will give, and you have not asked for money or victory over your enemies or growth of your, of your kingdom. Because that's what you asked for, I will give you wisdom, plus I will give you all those other things. I will give you wealth, I will give you long life, I will give you all those things. Well, of course, later in his life, because Solomon really liked the ladies, he married a lot of women, had a lot of concubines, thousands of wives and concubines. Can't even imagine. Uh, he... He, and a lot of the women he married, and some of these were for political reasons. I mean, to establish treaties with surrounding nations so they didn't have to go to war with each other, things like that. Marriage was one of the most important diplomatic tools in the ancient Near East. Um, but for whatever reason, he married foreign women, which was pretty strictly against the rules that God had set up. God had also told him, don't gather a lot of horses, and apparently he had huge stables full of horses. Why? Horses are military, remember. But uh, Solomon, late in his life, began to allow and appears to even encourage the worship of other gods because his, his non-Jewish wives from other nations worshiped other gods. He actually set up um, various altars for them to worship their gods to the extent that there was human sacrifice happening right outside the walls of Jerusalem. The Valley of Hinnom, which is just on the um, west side, of the valley of what was the city of David at that point, or the, the walls of the city of David at that point. The valley of Hinnom, because of the human sacrifice that was happening there, there was constant smell, you know what, what it smells like when hair and skin burns, right? Uh, the, the smell, that's what gave us the traditional conception of hell as being uh, fire and brimstone. That the worship of pagan deities involved human sacrifice, especially the sacrifice of children. And there was the stench and smoke associated with that, okay? That's where the idea of fire and brimstone and hell really came from, from the Valley of Hinnom, right outside the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And it was Solomon that allowed and even encouraged that. Well, what happens is, late in his life, ultimately, when Solomon died, God split up the kingdom, that, you know, caused a division between the northern kingdom um, of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah as a punishment for all of Israel going that direction, but, but for Solomon, having, having led the way. So late in his life, Solomon was not as wise. He apparently got pretty cynical about stuff. If you think about what Solomon must have been like late in his life, 
and you read the pessim based on what we know about him, and you read the pessimism that you find in Ecclesiastes, that fits. It makes sense. And that's the traditional rabbinic interpretation, the traditional Jewish interpretation, is that this book was written by Solomon late in his life when he did not have his act together as much as he had earlier. Okay? That makes sense? Any questions about that? Yes? Unrelated question, but uh, Ecclesiastes comes in our Bible right next to uh, Psalms of Solomon, uh, by Solomon. Um, how does that happen in the Jewish? The Jewish Bible, the order is completely different. I don't think they're related to their they're connected not to, to each other. Not held together. Um, and and there's there's even more serious questions as to whether Solomon wrote the Song of Songs, which is why it is more typically called the Song of Songs and not the Song of Solomon. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, because we don't know if he wrote that that book either. And again, I've said this before, but I want to make sure you all always understand this. If a book says it was written by Paul, or it said it was written by John, or it said it was written by somebody else, then it is a huge deal when you say, no, it's not. But if it doesn't say, then scholarship has a perfect right to say, here's why I think it was this person or that person. That doesn't mean it shouldn't be in the Bible. That doesn't mean you're questioning its importance or the fact that it was divinely inspired. If it doesn't tell us who the author was, then saying it could be Solomon or it couldn't is not a, is not a negative. That's not a downside. That's not questioning the reliability of Scripture. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, we believe God inspired it. Whoever wrote it, we don't know exactly. So, again, I think there are reasons why it fits for this to be Solomon, even though there are some other reasons. There may have been some editors that came along later. Again, inspired editors, like Joshua was, a, was apparently an inspired editor of, of the Books of the Law, um, that, that added some stuff that's what causes it to have some Aramaic kind of references in it. Yes? You mentioned that Solomon knew about the human sacrifice and even encouraged it? Yes, he built the altars for his wives. That's, that's a, that's a very hard thing to believe that this man had... That he followed that, that far. That he fell that far, is right. Yeah, Just absolutely. So. It's very difficult. And understand the consequences. God had promised David that he would not do to David or David's son what he had done to Saul, and that is when Saul violated, you know, basically didn't follow God's instructions. He took the kingdom away from him. God promised David and Solomon. In fact, he says to David, if your son does not, is not obedient, does not follow me, he will be beaten with the rods of men. In other words, he'll suffer the consequences of his actions, but he, God says, I will not take the kingdom from him. Well, what happened is God kept his word. Even though Solomon had gone so far astray, he did not take the kingdom away from him. But after Solomon died, the promise had not extended to Solomon's son. And so the kingdom was split. It is true, God promised David that, uh, you know, that you, one of your descendants will always sit on the throne in Jerusalem while Jerusalem continued to be the capital of the king, southern kingdom of Judah. And... The, the kings of the southern kingdom of Judah were all descendants of David. That part of the promise was kept. But the division that happened after Solomon's death, when his son, Rehoboam, was unable to keep the kingdom together, uh, the, 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 uh, the division that happened then was because of the sin of Solomon. That, and that was a very serious thing. The whole plan that God had for the promised land and the, the unity of the people of, it, of uh, the chosen people, the Jewish people, all of that got messed up. That's how serious the sin of Solomon was, late in his life. So it was not a light thing, nor were, were the consequences light. Yes? I, I don't know that it's that real hard to understand how this could happen to Solomon, because you see that as you get older and you have more experience, it's like you have a choice to get better or to get bitter. <laughs> because you experience the injustice, the, the, the sin of the world, and you, you're constantly faced with that choice, and if you're extremely wise, it'd be, it's so easy to get prideful. Or, I mean, smart, it's really easy to Or it's so easy, if a wise person Not also wise. sees, oh well, no, yeah. a, a wise person also sees more clearly the brokenness, and so it's easier for them to get cynical about it, I believe. Yeah. I mean, somebody who really doesn't pay attention at all, do, 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 they just, you know, glide through life. Somebody who is wise enough, pays enough attention to really see what the world is like, it can be very hard for that person. Okay. I mean, you see, love songs are all written by young people. 
<laughs> I mean, I, I hate to say that, but I mean, you know, and it's not that we don't love when we're older, but we also love what, from what I have seen, the reality of what right. people really are. Okay? So, let's keep going here. The book of Ecclesiastes. Again, the author technically is unknown, but we believe traditionally that it was Solomon. If it was written in the time of Solomon, that meant it was written um, in the 10th century BC. You know, a little uh, around a thousand years before Jesus, in other words, 970 to 931. That's the period of time during which Solomon reigned. The theme, and we would, would believe it would be you know, um, the later time there. In other words, closer to the 931, closer to us, because that's when Solomon would have been older. Um, theme: the emptiness of life without God. And I'm going to talk. I'll open that up quite a bit more. Uh, the purpose is to show that satisfaction comes only from God, and it ends. Um, with fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of everyone after walk after wandering through all of the frustrations that exist that we'll talk about um, you might break it up in a very simple outline we're going to look at a more complicated a more complete outline in a minute uh, the thesis all is vanity is opened up in the first 11 verses then um, the writer Koheleth Solomon if you will goes through his all of his experience in trying to find meaning in life, and in doing so, he's doing that as a proof from his experience that all is vanity. He's saying, well, let me prove it to you. Let me tell you everything I've done to try to find meaning. And then he ends up, um, in the last part of the book, talking about counsel. So what do you do? If all of life is vanity, and in this case, vanity means meaninglessness. It means it doesn't have any meaning. Uh, vanity is something that only has appearance on the outside, but there's nothing, no, nothing consequential. It really is meaningless. So when you read one of the older translations like King James that says vanity, vanity, all is vanity, that means meaningless, meaningless, everything is meaningless. Okay, and that's what he's talking about. Now, a couple of things I want to I talk for a few minutes while we're on this slide about. One thing is that the writer of Ecclesiastes, Koheleth, is admittedly limited in his perspective. He is not divine. This book, and again, this is one of the reasons that, pe that, that people question whether it should be in the canon, this book is clearly from a purely human perspective. Now, it gets around at the end of saying, fear God and keep his commandments, so it brings God into it. Uh, he mentions God several places through it, but he comes back to that, but still, he says, this is my experience under the sun, meaning on earth. There, there's nothing overly spiritual about it. It's in the physical world. And he also talks about his experience being limited to knowing what happens between birth and death. In fact, he says over and over again, we don't even know what's going to happen after we die. He says, you don't know what's going to happen in the immediate future, much less what's going to happen after you die. That's one of the reasons he thinks it's meaningless. So the perspective of the writer here is admittedly limited. It is not a a divine perspective like we get in a lot of the other writings. Like, you know, Isaiah clearly is from a divine perspective because a lot of the stuff in there has to do with something that hasn't even happened yet. This is from one man's perspective, limited to the physical world and life as it as it has existed in one between birth and death of one person, okay? And he recognizes that. And again, while it begins with all his vanity. As the thesis, it ends with remember your creator in the early 12th chapter, and then 12.13 says fear God and keep his commandments, for that is the whole duty of everyone. So it begins with vanity and then struggles with it all the way through, but it ends with what we're left with is fear God and keep his commandments. Okay. Remember your creator. So it does end with a divine perspective, even though the vast majority of it is just about human existence. Now, it is wisdom literature, and wisdom is touted as being great, and, you know, he plainly says that wisdom is better than folly, better to be wise than foolish, duh, but that even wisdom has its strict limits when it tries to go it alone. When wisdom, human wisdom tries to address the meaning of life by itself, it's going to fall short. Even wisdom can't know, for instance, the greater purposes of God, or the ultimate meaning of existence. That's beyond the ability of a human to know even the wisest of humans, the writer says. Now, there are seven different things that the writer teaches us about, well, that wisdom teaches us. The writer tells us that wisdom teaches us. The first thing he talks about is nothing ultimately uh, endures. Everything ends. That we're on this treadmill producing and producing 
and none of it's going to last. The, the buildings are going to fall. Anything that you have left when you die is going to go to somebody else, and who, you don't know what they're going to do with it. So that pessimism, nothing ultimately endures. Secondly, he does talk about the fact that wisdom, while it has its limits, is better than folly. In fact, he says that God's gift to those who please him, who please God, is wisdom, which allows them to have a better perspective on life. So wisdom is better than folly. Third, he talks about the fact that human life has certain disharmonies and, and, uh, and mysterious kinds of um, juxtapositions of things. And he makes the point there. An example is, we think human beings are so special that we're the highest point of God's creation, yet we die like the lowest of animals. Mm -hmm. We all end up dead in the dirt. And he, so he that's an example to him of how there's, there's discontinuities, there's disharmonies in our human experience. You begin to see the heaviness, you know, the pessimism in some of this. Fourth, he says that God made humans upright. He made us righteous. He's referring to the Garden of Eden there. But we wandered off and violated our relationship with God. So even we are a disappointment. You get the sense throughout the book of Ecclesiastes that the writer wants human beings to, to really to be as noble as we have the potential of being. But we're not. We don't cut it. Um, he, he talks about all this potential and all the things we can do and all we can create and everything else, and yet, what does that get us? Okay. We are a disappointment to ourselves and to God. <laughs> okay. He then, point five, he says, people cannot know or control what is going to come after them. I've already referred to a couple of these. We don't even know or can't control what's going to happen in our immediate future. That there's a level of uncertainty that exists even there. Much less what's going to happen after we die. Now remember, the Jewish people did not have the same kind of perception in, in the Old Testament times about an afterlife that we do. There are references to it about souls surviving, but there was not a clear doctrine of the afterlife. Um, that really, in terms of Jewish faith, didn't come till Maimonides in the 11th century AD. So we're talking almost 2,000 years after this. Um, and so the idea that we don't know what's going to happen when we die. They had a concept of Sheol, the place of, of spirits, and et cetera, et cetera. But they did not have a well-developed theology of afterlife. Number six is, the writer says, that God keeps us in our place. God will not let us rise too far because he keeps us in our place where we, where we recognize our limitations, etc. And number seven, he talks about the fact that everything that exists is God ordered it. God decided how everything was going to exist. It's a very Calvinist book, by the way. <laughs> um, that God has put everything together with a certain plan and it will all end up the way he wants it to end up. And there is nothing we can do about that. All right? So, so the idea of election... And God's predestination, preordination of all things, the providence of God, goes all the way back to, you know, um, 3,000 years ago. All right? So those are some of the issues related to wisdom, what wisdom teaches us. And you see the pessimism. You see the heaviness in that. Okay. I want to look now, I'm going to walk, I want to walk through an outline of the book of Ecclesiastes and then look at some key verses and then some conclusions. Any questions right now about any of that? You guys have read this, so this is not a surprise to you, right? Right. right. He's really writing about himself. That's right. Yeah, that's the part about it's I mean, from a human perspective. He's putting it all on us, but he's really... Well, often wisdom literature, you remember from our, our class um, when we talked about the Psalms, we said that one, one of the, I'm sorry, the Proverbs, that one of the kinds of Proverbs are observations from experience, right? Uh, either sharing a personal experience or observations from experience, which is similar. And this, is the, this whole book is that, an ultimate example of that. This is like one long proverb of personal experience of all he has done and what he has drawn from. Now, he's, he's old, he's cynical, he knows he hasn't lived up to God's expectations, which is one of the reasons why he says we're a disappointment to God, because he knew he was, if, if this was Solomon. And yet, there is much in here for us to learn. How many people in, in our world today are looking for meaning in all the wrong places, right? Reminds me of a country western song. Okay. 
difficult. I always try to find the sense of my life. Yeah. When I, when I, sometimes I have, I have asked myself what am I doing here, what I have to do, if I have uh, a goal to make a that can you tell me what you want me to do? Right. When you read this, uh, at the beginning, uh, when you begin reading the, the, first, uh, the first reading of Ecclesiastes, you find out that uh, he, asked, he, he had the same experience. Mm -hmm. He felt that uh, well, anything was meaningless. Uh, even uh, but what I, I began to well, I love this because he he gave you some kind of hint about that you don't give too much importance to mm -hmm. all the things that at the end nothing is meaning. Right, <laughs> right, and that's I mean think about especially in the Western world, people work sixty or seventy hours a week. To make either to move up in the organization and gain authority and power. And where does that end up? You get a gold watch at the end, right? Or they do it to make money so they can buy stuff, and how much is enough? Right? I've, I've shared the experience in sermons and things that um, when I was a freshman in college, my brother's roommate, he was two years ahead of me, my brother's two years ahead of me, and his roommate had a stereo that he wanted to sell. And it was like, I thought the coolest thing in the whole world, you know, the speakers were separate. <laughs> it wasn't, you know, just a close and play kind of deal. And I, can, I told myself, if I can just buy that stereo, I will never want to have another piece of electronic equipment as long as I live. That will satisfy me. I didn't even have the speakers connected on that thing. And I paid for it over a period of four months. It's like, you know, 100 bucks a month for four months or something. I didn't even have the speakers connected before I was buying stereo magazines to decide what the next and then I bought a tape deck, and then I bought this, and then I bought that. And oh, if you can see the electronics that we own now, <laughs> um, we are never happy. There was a, I read a letter once. Uh, this was when Mark Hatfield was still Senator of Oregon, and he shared a letter. Uh, people were talking about taxes and tax reform and tax relief and all that sort of stuff. And Mark Hatfield said, well, I want to share with you a letter. I really received this letter. A woman wrote to him and said, Senator Hatfield, you have got to help us. The tax burden on us is killing us. We can't survive this any longer. By the time we pay taxes on our house, and on our cabin in the mountains, and on our four cars, and on our boat, and on our motor home, there's nothing left. You get it? Yeah, we yeah. feel sorry for you. Exactly. And yet, that's the way people think. That all of those things are necessary for my, to find, trying to find meaning. And yet, we don't find meaning. And yet that is the human condition. The book of Ecclesiastes pokes us right in the eye about all of that stuff. Not, it's not your labor or your wealth or your material possessions or your, you know, anything else. Nothing else is going to give you meaning. So stop trying. And he gives us his personal experience with that. And it's written from the perspective of a person who can have any of that. You know, you, you guys know about this, the 27 Club? The 27 Club is, is the number of celebrities, especially musical celebrities, Janis Joplin, Kurt Cobain, there's a whole list of them, who killed themselves when they were 27 years old. Oh, yeah. Now these were people at the height of their fame, with all the money probably that they could imagine ever spending, and every, you know, just celebrity in every sense of that word, word and yet they killed themselves. When are we going to figure this out? 3,000 years ago, the writer of Ecclesiastes figured that out. Okay. That's why this book is so important, I think. Okay, let's walk through um, the outline. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this. Walk through the outline, and then we're going to look at sections of the passages. Um, first, the author, or the teacher, preacher, gatherer, Koheleth, introduces himself. Then he gives us the theme. You know, vanity, vanity, all is vanities. Um, the, the life is meaningless. Right up front, he starts out with that, and then he unfolds it. Then he gives us an introduction about the inability of human work or toil to bring happiness. N nothing you can do by itself will make you happy. No matter how many houses you have or motorhomes you have or anything else. 
And, and by the way, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying owning a motorhome <laughs> is necessarily a sinful thing. We have a motorhome. It's not running right now, but we have a motorhome. Uh, the issue is, is that what you, you know? Do you do you have a drive to acquire those things, thinking that's going to give you some purpose in life? That's the issue. It's not money is not the root of all things. What is love the love, love of money, love. which means thinking that's going to give you meaning. Here, here's a truism that you can use for the rest of your life: Don't ever love anything that can't love you back. Okay. All right. Then, so the introduction, the inability of human toil or effort to bring happiness, and then he begins a two-part discourse, which is basically the, the argument in support of his starting, his opening line. He starts out talking about, despite the meanings, meaninglessness of life, life is still something that we can enjoy as a gift from God. And again, when I say that, that is, is Koheleth is the writer of this coherent, and is he consistent? He... He argues with himself in here. And I don't think it's because it's not, it's not consistent. I think it's very consistent with human beings. Human beings are not consistent. If you haven't figured that out, you're not paying attention. <laughs> People don't always think consistently about things. And we have the advantage here of seeing somebody with great wisdom actually struggling with himself over how he understands these things. Life, you know, life is meaningless, but it should be enjoyed as a gift from God. Why are we even alive? Better to be dead. But even a live dog is better than a dead lion. And, you know, it's, he's struggling with these issues, and we get to watch. Right? Um, then, underneath that first discourse, he starts out saying, human wisdom and efforts are meaningless. But we can enjoy life and work and its fruits as gifts from God. In other words, it comes from God, not from us. Don't think what you try to achieve is going to give you satisfaction. But we can find enjoyment in the things that come from God. He then introduces the idea that he, more, he gets into more specifics. Human endeavors are meaningless. And again, he talks about, he apparently had unlimited resources. He bought land, he planted forests, he planted gardens, and I don't think he was out there on his own knees, knees putting seeds in the ground. You know, he purchased flocks, he had uh, public works, utilities works, and on and on and on, all these different human endeavors. And after all that, he decided that the endeavors are meaningless and that even pursuing human wisdom is meaningless. And again, that inconsistency, what seems like inconsistency, on the one hand, he says that wisdom is better than folly. If you pursue wisdom, it will teach you. But then he says pursuing wisdom itself is meaningless. And he talks about learning um, as part of that. He says, I studied many books, I learned many things, and, and, it, it, and it brought me much wisdom, and yet that too is meaningless. And so, great learning. If we think that's what's going to give us a sense of value, same thing. Um, he talks about seeking pleasure being, being meaningless. So he went through a period of time of hedonism, where he was doing everything that he thought would feel good, satisfying all of his appetites, and that did not satisfy him. Boy, that's one that our society needs to learn. Mm -hmm. Then again, he comes back to human wisdom is meaningless. He talks about toiling to accumulate things meaningless for two reasons. Well, for more than two reasons. Because people must leave the fruits of their labors to others. And he says, you know, you fill up storage barns with grain, and then who gets them when you're gone? Do you even know? Um, so someone else will benefit from the fruits of your labor. And secondly, because for all of your human efforts, ultimately everything is under God's sovereign will. What people, and people can't change that. They can't even fully know that. God is going to do what God will do, whatever. So why are you struggling so hard? And then he goes on with more examples of this, uh, the meaningless of, meaninglessness of gathering together possessions. Uh, Third, because there are better things than envy, greed, and ambition that motivate such toil. He recognizes that there are negative things in us that prompt us to try to gather all of these possessions. Envy, greed, and ambition. And those are bad things, and they will tear you apart. And yet, those are the things that usually prompt us to try to acquire. And because the fruits of human labor can be lost, leading to frustration. A fire, a flood, a natural disaster, a theft, this stuff that you worked so hard for can be gone in a minute, and you'll experience that frustration. So why bother in the first place? Okay? 
Then he goes to the point that people can't know what's best to do or what the future holds, and he comes back to the idea, so enjoy life and the work God has given you to do. In other words, deal with what's in front of you. Do the work you've got to do. Find enjoyment of that. Enjoy simple things, food and family and the simple things in life, and don't, don't shoot for the moon because you're just going to be frustrated. He, in, under this theme, he introduces the fact that God's predetermined will is unalterable. People can't know what's best or what the future holds. And then he, he unwraps these things. That people can't know what's best to do. People can't know what the future holds. He keeps hammering on some of these things. Then he gets into the second part of his discourse. The discourse, again, being the argument in favor of life being meaningless. Old age and death will come. You're not going to be here forever. So people should enjoy their youth knowing that God will judge. All right? You're the, the older you get, the less you're sure you're going to be here forever. Right? <laughs> it's a fact. I mean, young people, they're, they're, yeah, they're never going to die. There's a reason why we put 19 and 20 year olds in the front lines of the military. <laughs> Not because it's more expendable, but because they're willing to do it. You take some 40-year-old, 50-year-old and say, okay, you're in the front of the side, we're going to charge those machine guns. They're going to go, like, really not? <laughs> because, because I'm going to be the first one to go. Okay. Young people don't think that way. Oh, they'll never get me. The fact is, as you get older, you recognize that old age is upon you. Death will come. And so enjoy your youth as long as you've got it. Because you will die and there will be judgment. Mm -hmm. So enjoy life on earth because the future after death is mysterious and it's meaningless for our present lives. Enjoy the fleeting joys of youth. You know, he really is envious of youth. Mm -hmm. The right, the Koaleth, the writer of Ecclesiastes, clearly is, is remembering a time when he was young enough to enjoy these things and he's, you know, he's bitter about it. So he keeps saying, you better enjoy it while you can because it's not going to be here very long. And that's from his own experience. Right? Do you not find that as you encounter older people and yourself are getting older, that that is still very, and oh, very absolutely. true, uh, that's, very That's the whole of human experience. You know, yeah. that, and that's why this book is so important, is because it still absolutely applies to us today. Everything about it applies to us today. And in fact, if, you know, if we would take this book and pay attention to what it's telling us and live our lives according to that, we would be far more Christ-like. I mean, we would be far better um, servants. To, and I'm not saying that by itself it's enough. You know, we need the, the message and salvation of Jesus. There's other things we need too, but most of the real problems, most of the spiritual problems, most of the very practical hurdles that our society and we stumble over are right here. Okay? Um, he then says people should remember their Creator, and his gifts in their youth before old age and the deterioration of the body. In other words, appreciate God while you're young. Don't wait until you get too decrepit to really do anything about it. Okay. He then repeats the theme, vanity, vanity, all is vanity, and then his conclusion, that we should reverently trust and obey God. Okay. So that's the outline. Let's look at some of the key verses. It starts out, First chapter, the words of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher. Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. <laughs> okay? That you, you feel like that's what's next, right? It's like this is a suicide note. Um, but he goes on. What do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. Just one thing after another, one day after another, one thing after another, it never changes. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north, round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. To the place the streams come from, there they return again. Okay? Right? You know, evaporation, rain, streams, sea, evaporation, rain. It's all just continuous. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. You've heard that. Oh, yeah. 
The idea, when it says, um, the eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear is full of hearing, he's saying, you're never really satisfied. You know, you want, to, you want to see beautiful things, but it's never beautiful enough. There's never enough of them. You know, I love to travel, and yet every once in a while I get this feeling about, I go someplace for two weeks and then I come back, and what did I really gain? I enjoyed it, and there is room for enjoyment in life. You know, enjoy life, that's what he says elsewhere. But still, we need to recognize that if that's the whole point of my life, is to have those experiences, really? Has my eye seen enough? Has my ear heard enough for it really to be satisfying? No. That's not where satisfaction is going to be, even though you can enjoy those things. Make sense? Questions about that? Teaching Ecclesiastes is much more like preaching than it is. <laughs> um, okay. Then he continues starting with verse 12 of that first chapter. I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. And again, the suggestion of Solomon there, because Solomon was known as the wisest of all kings, at least early on. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom, and also of madness and folly. This is where he gets into hedonism. But I learned that this too is, chasing, is a chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. This is what I was saying, that a person who is wise sees all the absurdities and the pain and the, and the ridiculousness and, of, of life in a way that somebody who's just doo -doo 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 through life doesn't see. Then in chapter 2, he says, a man can do nothing, and in, in between, by the way, he talks about learning and wealth and everything else. The, I'm, I'm only picking pieces of this, and in between he talks about specific experiences that he has pursued in order to try to find something that means something. So Ecclesiastes 2.24 says, A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This is after all of the, you know, the using his wealth and power to do other things. This too I see is from the hand of God, for without him who can eat or find enjoyment? To the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness, but to the sinner, he gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. Hmm. Questions about that? Okay, now everybody sing along. <laughs> this is what the birds face turn, turn, turn on. Okay, this is from chapter 3. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. You can hear the tune, right? Uh -huh. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather stones together. <laughs> um, a time to embrace and a time to refrain, a time to search and a time to give up, a time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. Let me ask you the question I always ask in Bible study. What do you think he's getting at here? What do you think he means by all this? All of this balance of positives you know, and negatives and... Every life is going to be filled with every one of those things. Yeah, life is filled with all and of this. And you're not going to escape the good or the bad just because you do good. And everything is going to pass. Mm -hmm. You're going to have good times, you're going to have bad times, and that's the state of life. Right. All of this is going to happen, and for the most part, you can't really control it. Understand it's coming and accept it. I think that's what he's saying. There's a time for everything, and it will come. There will be a time for birth and death, planting, uprooting, killing, healing, all of these things will come to you. Don't be shocked by any of them. 
and don't expect you ultimately can affect any of them. There is a season for everything under heaven. Now that means on the earth, but it also means under control of heaven, I believe. All of these things will come to you. Don't look stunned when they do. Right? And not because we control them. Okay? I was listening to the speaker and he was talking about, you know, when dealing even with their children. And they said, oh, I can't believe my child, my child just did that thing. And he's like, well, why can't you believe it? You know, you, your child and you are just as capable as anyone of doing anything. Right. And, uh, you know, to, when we recognize our own human condition, it becomes easier for us then to be able to accept other people and love them for who they are, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of their performance. There, but by the grace of God, go I. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, let's jump to chapter 9. He reiterates a statement that, he, that I just read that he made earlier. Um, go, eat your food with gladness, drink your wine with a joyful heart, for God has already appointed what, what you do. The providence of God. God has predestined all actions. Always be clothed in white and always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love all the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun, all your meaningless days. <laughs> For this is your lot in life and your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. For in the realm of the dead, where you're going, there is neither working, nor planning, nor knowledge, nor wisdom. I have seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift, or the battle to the strong, nor does food come to the wise, or wealth to the brilliant, or favor to the learned, but time and chance happens to them all. You probably heard that. The race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong. It all happens. It all comes around. This last time and chance happens to all of them, I think refers back to the same theme as there's a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. It all comes. And it, it will happen as God plans it. And, and, and the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying, and you, there's virtually nothing you can do to influence that. And he says, because I try. Okay? Is this not pointing out the feebleness of, of man? Like we have such an ego that we think we have great control over sure. our ultimate end and our outcome. Yep. And even when we have been beat up by the world, you think, well, I'll just fix that. <laughs> Pull myself up by my bootstraps. Yeah. That's especially a Western, you know, concept. Um, so then verse 12. Not only was the teacher wise, but he also imparted knowledge to the people. He pondered and searched out and set in order many proverbs. And elsewhere, uh, this is Solomon. He was credited with writing uh, well over 3,000 proverbs. I think it was 3,600 if I remember right. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was upright and true. So either the writer here is now stepping back from this sort of autobiographical thing where he's speaking first person, and he's referring to it as third person, or else, you know, the other, the first part of the book up until now has been presented as something that was written, and now somebody else is adding commentary on it. Again, but we believe it's still inspired. The teacher searched to find just the right words, and what he wrote was up, upright and true. The words of the wise are like goads. They're collected sayings like firmly embedded nails given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, of anything in addition to them, of making many books there is no end, and much study wearies the body. Amen, amen. <laughs> now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the duty of all mankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. And there the book ends. Fear God, keep his commandments, that's our job, that's our duty. And, ultimately, everything that we do will be brought, will be judged before God. That's, that's Christian doctrine too. You know, we will appear before the great white throne of judgment. And all of the deeds we performed in our life will be judged they're good or evil. Those whose name is in the book of life, in our belief, meaning we have accepted Christ, we will have an eternity in heaven. But there will be a sense in which God will say to us, you were not a good child. Or, well done, thou good and faithful servant. God will judge all deeds. 
Any questions about that? Chris? Yeah, okay. This was a really depressing book to read, I thought. Um, and yet, the honesty of it well, is no, uplifting. Absolutely. Very, very well. No, absolutely. But I'm, try, I'm sort of trying to figure out, okay, in applying what's taught here in the life of a Christian who does fear God and wants to keep his commandments and who understands there's judgment, um, and you understand that life without God is pretty futile, but can you... So what do you take away? Like... Is it the idea, you know, is this a little confusing to me? Yeah. As to, okay, well, just enjoy life. I mean, I think we should enjoy life. I think good things come from God. But, like, is the point for a Christian to say, okay, we really need to fear God. We need to understand life's futile. We, or is there some um, counsel on how to live? Yeah. I think there is counsel on how to live. And I think I would sum it up this way. Uh, we all have decisions we have to make all the time. And some of them are life decisions. Am I going to take that job? Am I going to move there? I think that reading Ecclesiastes prompts us to say, well, what are my motivations? Is it because of I'm going to have more authority or more power or more money? And if so, is that a good reason to make a life choice? Because it's not going to satisfy See, and, and, um, and when I say, I really want to get that 84-inch, you know, 4K television, is that going to give me fulfillment? Is that going to satisfy me? Really? It doesn't mean it's, I shouldn't do it. It just means that before I make that decision, the book of Ecclesiastes has me say, what's my motivation? Why am I doing these things? Or why am I even thinking about doing these things? And given the Western culture, nine times out of ten, the answer is going to be that I'm wanting to do this for the wrong reason. Or I am doing this for the wrong reason. Okay? Um, I, read, I was reading a writer one time about pastoral call, and he said, you know, it's astonishing to me that I think I've never met a pastor who took a call to a smaller church. <laughs> now, I know an exception to that, by the way. But the idea is, what is our motivation? You know, what, what is prompting us to do that? Um, I, I'll tell you a story about a friend of mine, and if you ever watches this video, Larry, I'm telling the truth. Um, a friend of mine had, had always wanted to go to seminary. He felt that at some point God was calling him to seminary, and he wanted to go to Regent College in Vancouver, British Columbia, which is a theological school. I did my THM work there. And he knew, he knew a couple of professors. And, and yet, he worked for, uh, for Wells Fargo Bank, and he was very well paid. And they had offered him actually a promotion to move to a branch in Texas. And he felt this was the time he had to make the decision. We were in Seattle. We were very close to Vancouver. In fact, I drove up there when I was taking classes. And he was struggling with, well, do I, do I answer what I really believe is a call? And that people he knew, including professor at, at, at Regent, had told him, yes, you, you know, your call is to go to a theological training and go into ministry. Or do I take this job in Wells Fargo in Texas and make a lot more money even? And he was already doing pretty well, apparently. I don't know exact numbers, but you, know, you can tell. We were at dinner talking about that one night at a restaurant. And the way this restaurant was set up, right above us there was a wall and there was a, um, a short sort of cafe curtain up there. So the next level up there were tables that we couldn't see. We're talking about this, and I said, well, you know, we talked about what is, God, what is God saying to you, and we prayed about it, and we were discussing it, and I said, well, what is honoring to God? What do you feel is going to be honoring to God? Well, a woman had been eating at a table up there, and she had gotten up and walked to, out to the front to pay her bill, okay? We didn't know this at the time, but we figured it out months later. And I said, well, have you considered putting on a fleece? You know, the whole Gideon thing. And that is Gideon, Gideon, he put out a fleece and he said, Lord, if this is your will, then have the, the ground be wet and the fleece be dry in the morning. And that happened. And then so he said, Gideon said, okay, one more time. I need one more piece of proof. I'll put the fleece out. And if the fleece is wet, the ground is dry. The opposite the next day, then I'll know this is your will. And it was. And so he went forward. And I said have you, to my friend, have you considered putting out a fleece? Something that is that can be done, but is not necessarily likely 
that would be assigned to you that God wants you to do this. It's a very biblical principle. And he said, well, okay. He said, I, I think I know what I could say. Uh, I'm getting, he said, I'm getting ready to go to my high school reunion. I was not a Christian in high school. Everybody there, nobody there knows me as a believer. Okay, we're, we're 45 years old at this point. And he said, so I'm going to go on back there as a Christian. And he said, the thing that would be my fleece is that if someone comes up to me and says, um, I'm really moved by the fact that you're a Christian. I'm really, you know, it really touches me, the fact that you're a follower of Jesus. I said, okay, that's a good fleece. I have chills. Like every time I tell the story, I have chills. This woman who had been up above us, who had walked out to pay her bill, as soon as we said, yes, that's the fleece, she walked up to our table and she said, gentlemen, you don't know me. But I just want to tell you that it is so touching to me, it is so moving to hear two adult men talking about the Lord and talking about Jesus and to have two men who are Christians who really want to do what God wants from them touches my heart and that blesses me. And I just wanted to tell you that. And she turned and walked away. And I looked at him with chill bumps, which I have right now. I get them every time I tell a story because I swear to you this is true. I said, well, do you think you got your answer? <laughs> and he said, wow, yeah. He took the job in Texas. <gasps> oh, no. What? I don't believe it. What? <laughs> now, if you read Ecclesiastes and said, what, what's my motivation? People are like that. We do that. I'm not blaming him. No. That's the human condition. And yet, this book is all of the fuel we ought to need to be able to say, what am I basing my decisions on? In my mind, that was such a clear decision. Okay? Um, so, we, we all probably have some kind of examples where, contrary to all evidence God gives us, we make a decision against that. And so we need... This is, is instruction to us. What am I basing my life on? What am I basing my decisions on? What are my motivations? Is it pleasure? Is it wealth? Is it seeking learning for its own sake? Is it power and authority and influence? Or is it to recognize that God gives me simple pleasures to enjoy? And other than that, my, my motivation should be to and obey him, to be in relationship with him, to follow where he takes me. Does that help? Is that help? Yeah, that's an answer. Yeah. Okay. What's the rest of the story to Larry? <laughs> he he moved to Texas and worked for Wells Fargo, and I, I haven't communicated with him since. I mean, not because not I'm upset or anything, we just lost touch. So I don't know. I don't know what happened. Well, as a teenager, I, when I first uh, was really looking at really trying to give my life to the Lord, this kid pulled out the book of Ecclesiastes and pointed off all of these truths to me. And it was so, uh, you know, I can't believe as a teenager that I looked at this and this is exactly how I feel with what I'm experiencing in my life right now. And I couldn't believe that the Bible could be that relevant that many years ago. And that, that has been one of the most deciding and most important, it's been the most important time in my life, and just realizing that death is, death really is a certainty, because, you know, I just had my father die, I almost got killed in a car wreck, and I'm like, what's life about? And then they put this in front of me, and the final words, fear God and keep His commandments, and just said, okay, that's your answer. Yeah. Yep. All right, at the end, the writer of Ecclesiastes, having found no meaning in learning, pleasure, work, achievement, advancement, power, or riches, and so deciding that all human activity is meaningless, he tells his readers to seek wisdom as a means of living, uh, of a, of, as a means for a well-lived earthly life, even though wisdom has its limitations. I should say, we've already, because we just dealt with that, that, you know, fear God and keep his commandments, seek wisdom, and also enjoy the simple pleasures of Eating, drinking, taking enjoyment in one's work, for these are the gifts from the hand of God. You know, being the richest man in, in the country is not going to bring you joy. But being able to sit and enjoy a meal with friends or family, to laugh together, to have people that you love, that's satisfying. 
someone said, no one is ever going to be on their, no one ever on their deathbed says, boy, I wish I'd worked more hours. <laughs> I wish I'd gotten richer. You know, what are we going to say at the point of our death? That sort of brings it all in clar clarity. And, and it's sort of like the book of Ecclesiastes, the very pessimism of it drives away all of the fuzzy-headedness, just like being at the point of death would. Okay, that's why we've been given this book. Any other questions about, about that? Any of that? Do you feel differently about it now than maybe before, before when you read it? Um, it is one of my very favorite books, and mostly because there is nothing I ever know of, like Thomas Wolfe said, that has more wisdom just purely out of its honesty. Which of us is able to look at our own lives? I mean, we all, we all think we can look at somebody else's life and tell them what's wrong with you. But how many of us truly have the wisdom to look at our own lives and accurately evaluate whether all of the things we fill our days with are worthwhile or not? Whether they really give us meaning or satisfaction even. Um, and if they don't, admitting they don't, and recognizing that's not going to get us what we're really looking for. When I worked in hospice, uh, it was a uh, priest and residence, and so we had six people who were very close to death at that time, and uh, they went through this process, mm -hmm. uh, each of them in their own way, and our responsibility as caregivers uh, was to allow that to happen and to support them through this uh, internal struggle and to make their families aware uh, that this is uh, the realities and that everybody sooner or later needs to do it. But we keep setting these topics on the shelf and come back to them. Uh, maybe not till our last days, but visit them several times right. and gain more maturity and wisdom as we go through life. And I have so many families come up to me, even on city streets, and say, they are yours. And they had no words for it. They just had all-encompassing, genuine hugs mm -hmm. because of the simpleness, but the real realities of life. Uh, right there in those last two statements. They're yeah. just so, uh, so profound, so simple, that we cannot hardly uh, accept them or believe them. Right. Okay, I'm done. Unless somebody else has any other questions or comments. I will look forward to seeing you all, unless you're going to go to classes today or tomorrow. I will see you next week.